The place in which we're gathered today is rich in the theory and practice of indigenous political alliance, as, as Darren's introduction and welcome um, acknowledged. Holding the histories and presence of not only the Haudenosaunee, but also the Mississauga Anishinaabeg and the Wendant nations. These nations negotiated and continue to practice diplomatic relationships with each other and to share the land while respecting each other's governance, jurisdiction, and sovereignty. Each nation also exists in a deep reciprocal relationship with the Great Lakes, in particular Lake Ontario, and the waterways that flow into it. These nations foster deep relations to the St. Lawrence River leading to the Atlantic Ocean, the diverse plant and animal nations within their territories, the Thunderer and the Rains, and all the physical and spiritual forces that connect them to this place, their place of creation in an intimate and meaningful way. Now this theory and practice of indigenous alliance and solidarity is informed what I have called elsewhere grounded normativity, by which I mean the, the modes of indigenous land-based practices and long-standing experiential knowledge and expertise that inform and structure our ethical and political relationships with the world around us. Grounded normativity thus houses and reproduces the, these practices and procedures based on a relational ontology of deep reciprocity that are inherently informed by an intimate relationship of ourselves with place. Grounded normativity teaches us how to live our lives in relationship to other people and other than human life forms in a profoundly non-authoritarian, non-exploitative, and non-dominating way. Grounded normativity teaches us how to be in a respectful political relationship with other indigenous peoples and non-indigenous peoples with whom we might share territorial responsibilities or common political and economic interests. Our relationship to the land itself generates these processes, practices, and knowledge that inform our political systems and through which we understand and enact solidarity. I would therefore like to accept today's conference invitation to speak to the way that we might aim to, quote, open up new ways of seeing, studying global movement assemblages, the connections among them, the agencies they unleash, and the different possible worlds they call into being. And specifically to do so in conversation with critical humanist traditions, uh, notably feminism, anti-racism, post-colonialism, and indigenous social and political thought. My contribution then will focus on the global dimension of indigenous people's place and form struggles, particularly as they were and continue to be articulated with both the black radical and anti-colonial traditions epitomized by the revolutionary work of Frantz Fanon. Someone who I have gained much insight and inspiration from in my own work, but also because his influence here in the story that I'm telling or uh, will tell is just simply a fascinating one, I think. When I first began to conduct research on my own community's struggle for self-determination over a decade ago, it became immediately clear to me that our leaders in the Dene Nation saw our decolonized efforts as necessarily linked to the struggles of colonized peoples elsewhere, both domestic and international. Indeed, the Dene Nation was explicit about these connections. Now, I just recently came across this draft of the declaration in the archives, and when I looked at it, it kind of made sense to me. Um, this idea of formal independence occurring simultaneously with economic subjugation, enemies from within and without spawn and reproduced through an internalization of one's own subjecthood. All of these concepts were drawn from the third world theorizing of the likes of Albert Memmi, Nkwame, Nkwame Nkrumah, and of course, Frantz Fanon. In turning to these theorists, we were not, as critics of the day suggested, however, uh, simply being brainwashed, brainwashed by our white consultants. Rather, we were critically engaging in a global assemblage of anti-imperialist actors that had well-established roots among radicals of all stripes in Canada during the 1960s and 70s. Fanon, in particular, was a central figure in these conversations. Now, Fanon's impact in North America, especially in the United States, has been well noted by scholars like Baba and Stuart Hall. In particular, Fanon's writings on colonial racism and national liberation um, indelibly shape the more militant arm of the civil rights movement, as well as both the black and red power movements of the 1960s. Now, the profound mark that Fanon left on 1960s and 70s anti-imperialist and anti-colonial radicalism led Stuart Hall to declare the wretched of the earth nothing less than the Bible of decolonization. 
Interestingly, however, Fanon's influence is perhaps even more pronounced, although decidedly less discussed, in Canada. Perhaps more on the mark, though, has been Fanon's stamp on the intellectual output of Indigenous scholars and activists in Canada. Out of all Red Power era voices, Fanon's influence was most influential on the written work, at least, or in the written work of the late Métis historian uh, Howard Adams. Although, as I've come uh, to learn in conversations with Lee before, which he probably doesn't remember, that it also uh, <laughs> uh, uh, left a profound mark on indigenous feminists like Miracle and others associated with the radical red power organizations like NARP in the 1970s, which is indexed importantly in a couple of crucial passages in her uh, Bobby Lee Indian Rebel. Now, according to Adam's own account, uh, he was first introduced to the literature of the black power uh, movement, Malcolm X, Cleaver, and so on, and the writings of third world anti-colonialists like Nkrumah, Fanon, and Memi, while a graduate student at Berkeley during the turbulent decade of 1960s radical activism. This experience would significantly shape the theoretical and historical analyses Adams develops in his two major political works, uh, 1975's Prison of Grass, Canada from a Native point of view, and his 1995 follow-up, uh, Tortured People, Politics of Decolonization. In both these texts, Adams applies Fanon's insights into the nature of internalized violence to show how colonialism is able to um, sediment its dominance over native lands and bodies by warping our self-image and behavior um, in ways that make our dispossession and political subjugation appear appropriate uh, to our own uh, perceived cultural inferiority and backwardness. Now, if the influence of so-called third world theory arrived in 1960s Montreal via Fanon and Martinique, and onto the Canadian prairies via Howard Adams and Berkeley, or onto the West Coast via uh, Lee Miracle and NARP, I suggest it arrived in the North through the Dene Nation's working relationship with Shuswap leader George Manuel. There's ample evidence to support this claim. First, Manuel was a strong supporter of our, uh, the Dene Nation's land struggle and worked closely with its leadership to promote our bid for self-determination, as demonstrated in the pages of testimony he gave to the, uh, in, in Yellowknife at the public hearings of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry in 1976. As stated in that testimony, Manuel saw the Dene as part of what he would come to champion as the fourth world, a phrase he first came across at an international gathering of diplomats from Tanzania and a number of other African countries in the early 1970s. Manuel's African ties were extensive. In 1974, he traveled to Tanzania as part of Canada's uh, delegation of diplomats invited to attend the commemoration of its 10-year anniversary since independence and, as the story goes, was mistaken by local politicians, including President Julius Nyeri himself, as one of Canada's lead delegates. <laughs> he was, at the time, the, um, the uh, uh, national chief of what was then the National Indian Brotherhood, now the Assembly of First Nations, um, which is just fascinating. <laughs> Uh, the elite access, however, that this miscommunication enabled provided Manuel with an opportunity to gain lengthy conversations with President Nairi and some of his key uh, government ministers, apparently over copious amounts of wine, about the respectful uh, colonial experiences and what a genuinely post-colonial form of economic and social development might look like, one that didn't, as Fanon insisted, take its cues from mimicking European models. As Manuel states in his foundational The Fourth World in Indian Reality, as all models of economic and social development I have seen, Tanzania is the closest example to my understanding of the way that Indian people want to develop. Tanzania is such a good example of the difference between the third and fourth world because neither of the people nor their leaders have been content to produce a new society that is merely a darker imitation of the world of their colonial masters. Now, when the Dene Declaration was made public in 1975, the predominant response was hostile. As I discuss in my own book, then Minister of Indian Affairs, Judge Buchanan, dismissed our declaration as gobbledygook that a grade 10 student could have written in 15 minutes. Even respected Cree leader Harold Cardinal condemned the declaration as an intrusion of left-wing thinking that is perhaps much closer to the academic community in Toronto than it is to the Dene. Much of the criticisms that were thrown at us at this uh, period expressed similar sentiment, uh, namely that the Dene leadership had been manipulated by southern white radicals and were therefore not acting in the interests of our own constituents. Uh, this assumption extended to the writing of the declaration itself, 
which at the time was believed to be by most non-natives in the north to be drafted by one of the Dene Nation's non-native consultants, uh, namely Peter Puxley, based on his adaptation of Tanzania's Arusha Declaration of 1969. The thrust of the argument here again being that those cross-fertilizations could not have been grounded on Dene values or are grounded in normativity and relationships through place, but had to come from the ideological influence of either settler society or uh, those elsewhere. Nothing could be further from the truth. As demonstrated in, a 19, or in an April 14, 1975 letter between a representative of the Ganawage sub-office of the Indians of Quebec Association and then Vice President of the Dene Nation, Richard Nirosu, detailed plans were in the works to send Dene field workers, which were essentially community-based activist researchers at the time, to Tanzania to, quote, learn from their experience in development for a period of two to three months. The letter was included as an information package compiled in 1977 by the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly uh, to generate public concern over the radical and separatist nature, or so supposedly separatist nature, of the Dene self-determination movement. We were also communists, too. They didn't like that. Um, also included in the package was a list of reading materials that then Dene Nation Community Development Program Director George Erasmus suggested might be useful in constructing a quote development philosophy for the Dene Nation. The list of readings included among others Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Albert Memmi's The Colonizer and the Colonized, and Regis Debray's Revolution in the Revolution. Also included in the materials were books on Tanzania specifically, including Nyerere's collection of speeches, Freedom and Socialism, Freedom and Unity, Nyerere on Socialism, and Socialism and, uh, and uh, Ujama, Essays on Socialism. According to Erasmus, these, quote, alternative sources on development were meant to supplement, not replace, research and perspectives drawn from our communities. Many alternatives must be looked at, wrote Fanon, or Fanon, Erasmus. <laughs> in a memo addressed to the Dene field workers, especially the examples of our culture, the approach to development and distribution of material and ownership that our forefathers took. We may wish to keep some aspects of the old way in this industrial era. Now the point of all this is that the resurgence politics that I advocate and, uh, for necessarily as Conway and her interlocutors suggest is an international assemblage of decolonial movements that are necessarily grounded in the normativities and ontologies of culture and place, but are not simultaneously straightjacketed by them, as many champions of progress and modernity suggest. Fortunately, however, it is the radically expansive politics of this grounded normativity that state-centric calls for recognition and redistribution, and then just the onslaught of more repressive aspects of state violence are either uh, are fundamentally working to undermine and destroy. So, thank you. Bonjour, Kinoaya. Gede gabajina denewema. Kini gichi nish na veko gumi na donjaba. Na gojo wa mego ado da petasme sak ne dish na kaz. Ne gichi nendem gibe jayan ma anda ek narawak aki na wen shimi guach. So. Uh, my academic and my artistic work is based within Anishinaabe thought and Anishinaabe intelligence. And so that's where I turn um, to theoretically and methodologically when I think about social movements and I think about organizing and I think about resistance and resurgence. And so um, I come at it from a little bit of a different theoretical perspective and I want to talk today, or I've been asked to talk today about the I Don't Know More movement. And so I first sort of want to take a step back and, and just um, acknowledge the, the ongoing history um, and the context that that movement took place in. And so I get up really early in the morning and <laughs> I write uh, because no one else is up and, and it's an easy time for me to write. And I watch the sun come up. And our word in Anishinaabe Moin for dawn is the word bedaben. Bidabin. And it literally means dawn if you were to look it up in the dictionary. But if you split that word apart, it's, um, it's interesting conceptually and theoretically. And to me, it has a lot to do with what we're talking about uh, today and at this assemblage. So the B part is a prefix 
that is a future tense. So it indicates that the future is coming towards us. So the future is coming at us at that moment when that sunlight first comes up above the, of the horizon. The da, da is a word that means home or the present or right now, the, the exactly right now. And then ba or ban is a suffix that we would use at, um, to add to someone's name after they've passed. So you add it to something that no longer exists. So it's the past. So that moment every day when that first light appears is a collapsing of the future and the past onto the present. And so for me, thinking about that every morning means um, I don't think so much about futures and futurisms, but I think very, very much about what we're doing in the present. Because that moment, that moment is a moment of creation and a moment of artistic presence. So what does this have to do with mobilization? Well, I'm Mississauga Anishinaabek, and my territory is on the north shore of Lake Ontario, just north and east of here. My nation has lived through, alongside the black community in Ontario, 400 years of settler colonial violence aimed at removing our bodies from the land. Our bodies are attacked for the purposes of dispossession and maintaining that dispossession through heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. This is an eliminatory violence that asymmetrically targets two-spirit and queer indigenous bodies to the point in 1724, where we have a French Jesuit missionary and ethnologist in my territory bragging in a book that after 75 years of Jesuit missionary work, queer indigenous people were now looked upon with scorn by their own people. That's in 1724. So it's a miracle that I'm here today. It's a testament to the resistance and to the mobilization of my ancestors my family, my community, and my nation, that I exist at all and that I can say any words in my language. And so I think a lot about what my ancestors and what my family and what my nation did to ensure that I survived today and that I can be here today at all. And that seems like a, a miracle and that seems like there's a tremendous amount of brilliance and mobilization and organization and resistance that went in to having any uh, brown, black, or red bodies on the land right now at all. So there's a lot of different kinds of resistance. And a lot of times when, when Canadians think of resistance, they think of protest and they think of the I don't know more movement. But that movement was based on 400 years of resistance that took place before. It's a blip. The fall of 2012 and the winter of 2013, this resistance became visible to Canadians during the Idle No More movement. I participated in that movement as an organizer and as a writer, and I thought a lot in the aftermath about Indigenous mobilization and organizing, what we did well and what we didn't. Idle No More was a coalition of a lot of different diverse peoples within the Indigenous communities. So there was people that were mobilized and that were participating in those protests because they wanted the omnibus bills that the Harper government brought in uh, changed. There were other people that were mobilized because they were concerned about the social conditions on reserves, particularly in, nor in the North. There were others that were mobilized because they wanted uh, their treaty rights recognized and affirmed by the Canadian state. There were activists that had been working on missing and murdered Indigenous women and environmental issues, and then there was a a group of, uh, of us that were interested in indigenous resurgence. And so from my participation in, in that movement, I want to share some of my thinking, and, and it's pretty early on in the, the thinking and analytical stage, um, in the form of four interventions of, of what I learned and, and what I think that we need to do differently. The first thing that I thought a lot about is movement building and organizing in the era of the internet. Um, because on one hand, the internet was insanely useful to us because we were able to mobilize a large number of people very quickly into single points on the, on the ground. It was also very useful in terms of self-representation because the Canadian media is extremely racist. And um, to get our message out, um, we were able to write the movement at the same time it was happening on the ground and develop a series of blogs um, to represent our, our own issues and our own voices and influence the corporate media that way. And that was also very useful. But there are also some problems with internet organizing. And ultimately, I think the collapse of the movement 
um, is in part due to some of the problems with um, internet organizing. When Anishinaabe people mobilized in the past, we spent a considerable amount of time movement building. We did this for a few reasons. The first of which is that our political system is relational and it's entirely built on relationships with humans and non-humans, with the land and with other political orders. So Anishinaabe life, Anishinaabe worlds are hubs of relationships through time and space. That's the world we built and that's the world we live in. So it makes sense then at times of political tension or upheaval or in times of transformation that you sink increased presence into those relationships that will sustain you individually and collectively through that transformation. So in the time of Pontiac or Tecumseh, this meant traveling long distance with delegations, visiting with your people, sharing ceremony, food, developing face-to-face -face intimacy, and building trust. This wasn't a unique practice that was reserved for times of transformation or upheaval. This movement, this relationality was the fabric of life, organizing as a way of life. This movement building step is critical in all movements, but I think it's particularly crucial to think about it in the age of the internet when a seemingly shortcut exists. Seemingly because on a very basic level, I wonder how the internet as another structure of control whose primary purpose is to make corporations money is at all helpful in the movement building phase. I wonder if the simulated worlds of the internet are simulations that serve only to amplify capitalism, misogyny, transphobia, anti-queerness, white supremacy, and create further dependencies on settler colonialism in the physical world. I wonder if this can create a further alienation from oneself, from indigenous thought and practices, and from the indigenous material world. I wonder if this is a digital dispossession from ourselves because it further removes us from what my colleague calls granted normativity. <laughs> the internet is the ultimate Cartesian expression of mind and mind only. There are no bodies on the internet. There's no line, land on the internet. Insertion of indigeneity then into cyberspace is not an insertion of indigeneity into the physical world. And as much as it hurts me to exist, um, this grounded normativity doesn't structurally exist in the cyber world because it's predicated on deep, spiritual, emotional, reciprocal, real world relationships between living beings. Dispossessed from our indigenous material worlds, our thought systems and our practices, are we losing the ability to create makers and to solve problems, or at the very least, are we accelerating this loss because most of our time is spent on screens connected to the internet? How are we building a movement that centers indigenous makers when internet access is so unevenly distributed across our territories? Yet almost more than any other structure, the internet has structurally intervened in my life. There's a tremendous asymmetry here. The internet and digital technologies have become a powerful site for reinforcing and amplifying settler colonialism, and I see losing the ability to structurally intervene as highly problematic. Code and algorithms are controlling our lives, and, our capital and capitalism is controlling code. For indigenous people, this takes place in the wider context of settler colonialism as the controlling structure in indigenous life. Every tweet, Facebook post, blog post, Instagram photo, YouTube video, and email we sent during Idle No More made the largest corporations in the world, corporations controlled by white men with a vested interest in settler colonialism, more money to reinforce the system of settler colonialism. I think that we have to think critically and strategically about adopting digital technologies as organizing and mobilizing tools because on one hand they're very, very powerful. But we need to think critically about what are we gaining, what are we losing, how do we refuse the politics of recognition, engage in a generative refusal, and operate with opaqueness on the internet. Can we operate from a place of grounded normativity on Facebook when the algorithm attacks its very foundations? This leads me to um, my second intervention around leadership and where the consequences of internet organizing really impacted Idle No More was in and around January 11, 2013, where the Indian Act chiefs were in boardrooms in Ottawa negotiating with the Harper government, and I don't know more, was out on the streets. Um, so it was, it was sort of a sucker punch. It was a, um, a, a co-opting 
um, and uh, uh, creating divisions within the movement, and it was which which states will always do. But when we had such a, um, a shallow set of relationships that were mediated through the internet, there was no th way that we could withstand that. So it was at that point that I began to realize that Idle No More wasn't a movement that we could sustain. Most of my comrades I had never met in person. While there were small groups of people meeting and strategizing about specific actions and events, we had no mechanisms to make decisions as a movement because at this point social media had replaced organizing. Disagreements over analysis or action occurred online in front of everybody because we had shallow cyber relationships instead of real world ones and the larger structures fell apart quickly. We tried to build a movement online through social media and when we needed to trust each other, when we needed to give each other the benefit of the doubt, when we needed empathy and a history together that we could trust, we couldn't. When we were sold out by leaders who didn't represent us, we were not able to regroup and relaunch the movement. This was the first significant pushback from the state and it crushed us and maybe with, without the state even doing anything at all, we would have crushed ourselves. I wonder maybe if in hindsight we didn't move a, build a movement, but we built a, a social media presence. A social media prevalence that privileged individuals over community, virtual validation over empathy, leadership without accountability and responsibility, and unchecked liberalism that has now left us extremely vulnerable to the superficial recognition of the neoliberal state. We cannot allow the internet Whiteness cannot decide who our leaders are by likes, shares, and how well they conform to corporate media. My third intervention. <laughs> it matters profoundly to me uh, how change is achieved. My ancestors were maker, they, makers. They got up every day and they made their political system and their legal system, their food systems, their economy, their healthcare systems, their education system, their ethics, and their infrastructure, and their technology. They didn't rely on states, on institutions, on democracy, or banked capital to take care of their families. They relied on each other. They got up every day and collectively built the world they lived in. In a sense, they were always mobilized. They were always in a state of organization, of movement, of creativity. Trudeau cannot do this for us. Electoral politics will not and cannot do this for us. White people will not and cannot do this for us. Which takes me back to Bedabin, that first light of dawn. The present gives birth to the future. How you're living in the present determines what's going to happen in the future. It matters how change is achieved. So the kind of change that I'm talking about, the reason why I was on the streets in Idle No More was not to get Trudeau elected. I know you're all shocked. <laughs> it was to build a radical alternative present that would give birth to the kind of future in which my ancestors would recognize this coming generation as Mississauga and Ishnabek. The only way to build a radical alternative present is to make it on the ground in real time with real people just like my ancestors did. This means a refusal of colonial recognition, and it means that that refusal must be generative. It must generate the alternative. If I think back to my creation stories, which is our theoretical anchor in my work and in my culture, um, people were created from all different kinds of, of places and in all different kinds of ways, but it was never easy. It always came through struggle. Mistakes were made, prototypes were built. It came from a being or being, it came from being fully engaged in a creative process that was a process of struggle. So building a new world is not gonna be easy. It is struggle. And sometimes I wonder, uh, in Adel No More, if we shied away from that. We didn't want to do that work. It's easier just to post stuff, right? So the crux of resurgence to me is that indigenous peoples have to create and regenerate our political systems and the systems of life from within our own intelligence. We have to create indigenous worlds, not on the internet, but in the physical reality. Our movements must respond to the basic social needs of our communities, relief from crushing poverty, clean drinking water, listening to youth and then doing what they tell us to create meaningful existence for them and their communities right now. Supporting harm reduction approaches to addictions, dismantling children's aid, and supporting people recovering from the damage they have caused, 
setting up alternative accountability structures for gender violence to two-spirit queer people, women and children are safe. Um, these social issues are not social. They are political, and they are a direct result of the state violence in the form of settler colonialism that maintains and accelerates dispossession. These are our first responsibilities. So we can't separate the social conditions of our, of our communities out from our political work. This has to be at the center. We have to be responding to those issues that are, that are crushing our communities. My fourth and final <laughs> intervention um, is around creating constellations of co-resistance. I'm really, really tired of white rock stars deciding what indigenous issues are important to talk about and organize around. I'm really tired of the continual production and amplification of victim narratives to feed white Canada's appetite for trauma porn. I'm tired of the state continually gutting indigenous resistance through royal commissions, national inquiries, and the false consciousness of reconciliation. I'm tired of watching us beg the colonizer for political and institutional recognition. I'm tired of mobilizations designed only to gain political or institutional recognition. I'm tired of our movements replicating heteropatriarchy and anti-blackness. I'm tired of asking for change instead of building the change. So what happens when we stop centering whiteness in our movements? What happens when we refuse settler colonialism as a starting point in our mobilizations? What happens instead of constantly and continually appealing to white allies, we build constellations of co-resistance locally and internationally with those communities actively building ethical, principled, radical futures in the present by animating and embodying those ethical systems as the intervention. Freedom breathes a little bit when this happens. Whether it's Black Lives Matter TOs stopping the Pride Parade in Toronto, which was brilliant, or the community of resistance in South Dakota protesting pipelines, or the Unistoten camp in northern BC, or Mississauga families harvesting wild rice every year in front of angry cottagers. Bodies on the land, realizing indigenous political and ethical realities, breathing life into indigenous ground and normativities. Badabin, the first light of dawn, the past and the present collapsing the past and the future collapsing in on the present, the present giving birth to a radical, beautiful future that generatively refuses heteropatriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy, and collectively lives out the alternatives. Miigwech. This might sound like a long ellipsis, <laughs> um, but my comments are entitled Post BLM, The Black Radical Tradition in Crisis. So we are firmly in the post-BLM moment. By this, I do not mean that the activism of the movement is behind us, but rather that its activist energies are now part of a political landscape, thereby making a prism through which to apprehend our current political moment. So this paper grapples with the impact of the BLM movement in light of the long jury of black activism in North America and beyond. I argue that BLM is not simply a movement responding to the immediacy of police violence and abuse, but it sits in a genealogy of black activist eruptions meant to transform the state as we presently know it. By turning to the black radical tradition, this paper seeks to make present the return or the turn to a politics of the collective, even global, as a counter and a possible future for the organization of human and planetary life. The black radical tradition I'm reference, referencing is a tradition that understands knowledge production as intimately tied to the desire for freedom. The black radical tradition that I am referencing takes seriously the enslavement and colonization of black and African peoples as central, as central to the unfolding of world history. In this way, it's a confrontation with capitalism, land theft, and systems of knowledge conceived and put in place to render black and African peoples less than human and ultimately non-human. <clears throat> Following Cedric Robinson, the black radical to the tradition, quote, cast doubt on the extent to which capitalism penetrated and reformed social life and on its ability to create entirely new categories of human experience stripped bare of the historical consciousness embedded in culture, end quote. Indeed, for descendants of, trans, of the transatlantic slave trade, the black radical tradition is not a confrontation, it's, it's not a confrontation with land theft, but rather one with 
it's not a confrontation for us with land theft, but rather one with, with, um, with subjectivity or regaining our bodies, as Frank Wilderson has put it. Thus, the black radical tradition is a significant confrontation with the human sciences. So I've been thinking about, I've been thinking of one way to conceive of the Black Lives Matter movement, black, sorry, of Black Lives Matter as both slogan and organizing principle and thus political grassroots movement is to think of it as shock and trauma. Behind my claim is a simple assumption. The assumption is that black people, both in the USA and elsewhere, have been shocked and traumatized by forms of naked violence that many had perceived to be behind us. Indeed, it's important to note that the network of organizations that make up the movement for black lives in the USA consists of many that have consistently worked on, for example, police violence well before the BLM movement and moment. And yet, this moment marks some important differences as well that must be gathered around the phrase and the organization BLM. So anyone who cares to know knows that three black, queer, identified women coined the term BLM in response to the murder of Trayvon Martin in 2012. The still lingering collective trauma of his death, followed by so many others in, quick, in what appeared to be quick succession, added an important and necessary impetus and energy to mobilizing against state violence in this moment. Significantly, in the era of social media and its multiple intimacies, noticing those same state practices in other national spaces has been a significant boost for transnational black political identification and action. BLM is a significant symbolic rallying cry that achieves a certain kind of diaspora intimacy among black people. Nonetheless, it is fraught with many complications and complexities as it is extended into other national spaces. We might ask, how does, BLM, how does BLM travel? And the answer would be, of course it does. But let me risk a move here that might help us to think about the difference between a particular and specific politics of BLM traveling as opposed to BLM traveling as a metaphor. BLM has, BLM has practiced a politics of transnational political identification that is both within the black radical tradition in particular in relationship to um, indigenous cultures in North America and indigenous policies in North America and Palestine. So that these, these forms of political identification and solidarity have a long, long um, place in black radical politics. And simultaneously, BLM is, is hampered by empire and blackface as the Obama administration, for example, drones East Africa and the Middle East and uses Kenya and Ethiopia as proxies for its resource wars in Africa and as mentioned yesterday, most recently, the $100 million base that will be built in the Horn of Africa, among other forms of, of imperial global projects. So returning to the Americas, the present and urgent fate of Haitians, for instance, demands that we see and witness the compli complicities of empire in our time. My concern here is that Haitians must attempt to make a life in the context of a global order that wishes them to disappear from everywhere. As Haitians move within the Caribbean region and within the Americas more broadly, we, we, we witness the limits of modernist ideals, the most obviously being that of nation and citizenship. Haitian movement calls our attention to the, re, to the reigning lodges of white supremacist organization of all of our lives. Indeed, what travels from BLM is the emphasis on a life, on what a life might be, on how we might achieve our lives. And it is in this endeavor that that the one of achieving a life that Haiti rejoins Africa most spectacularly. So let me briefly turn our attention to the African refugee crisis, in particular the crossing of the Strait of Gibraltar, as a stretching of the metaphor and the politics of BLM. It's worth pointing out that most African refugees remain on the continent, but these crossings have become the most spectacular moment of the African refugee crisis. The late Stuart Hall has taught us that, the, that migration is what he calls the, the joker in the globalization pack, and that planned and unplanned migrations threaten to undo and upend neoliberal regiments of capital moving while lib is supposed to stand still, and often people are discarded when no longer needed. Indeed, while BLM might have been politically activated by state violence, most spectacularly police, police violence in the US, the movement in both its rhetoric and its links and its indebtedness to an international black radical tradition demands that we engage the African crisis as, a, as central to all of its concerns. Africans crossing the Mediterranean see in search of a life, a life denied them, both in terms of resources and in terms of logics of white supremacist world orders, 
contract and stretch BLM simultaneously. The insistence on life by Africans moving forces us to reconsider what exactly is a modern life, what exactly does it mean to claim oneself for a life. It is in fact the insistence on a life that black movement travel has continually upturned the fictions of modernist ideals. And it's not simply crossing the Strait of Gibraltar, I want to say, but even walking on the street, which is why, you know, things like Cardin and so on, that whenever black people move, the crisis of modernity announces itself. Can migration, planned and unplanned, continually returns us to the demand that we imagine a different world, that we risk putting flesh to ways of being in which a life becomes possible. African migration alerts us to the political demand that we make the world anew in the aftermath of the other great migratory moment of the post-1492 world. Indeed, BLM travels because the very idea of black, black and blackness in the modern world cannot de be divorced from movement. And, it's in, and it is in recognizing how fundamental movement and our migration is to late modern capital that we might begin to risk intellectually navigating a different present and thus future. In the Canadian context, the dark conditions of black life makes BLM of both slogan and movement a not surprising political identification for black people here. Indeed, one might argue that black Canadian political life and thus political desires or aspirations, not even policy, is far removed from the Canadian political process and scene. The Liberal Party of Canada has as one of its star members the former police chief of Toronto. The chief, has, the chief has been a stalwart of stop and frisk policy, which we call Cardin. None of the federal leaders of the pol political parties have felt any pressure of any kind to speak to the to, to speak to the practice to a practice like Cardin that disproportionately affects Black Canadians. In fact, in the last election, the leader of the NDP, which we like to call our our left party, promised to fund 2,500 more police nationally. So in some ways, the urgency of BLM holds important resonance for black Canadians. Canadian institutions, all of them, render black life invisible and tangential to the nation as a whole. For 15 days in March 2016, Black Lives Matter Toronto occupied the Toronto Police Services headquarters courtyard. They had a number of very simple yet important demands. They wanted a two-day festival called Afrofest to remain a two-day festival after it was reduced to one day by the city due to a few noise complaints. They wanted a subject officer to be named and arrested in the shooting of Andrew Loku, a mentally ill African Sudanese migrant, shot in the hallway of his apartment building, a building that housed the mentally ill. And they wanted an end to Cardin, stop and frisk, which disproportionately targets black and brown Torontonians. Those kinds of demands point to how the state shapes black life experience in ways that continually mark the thin line between life and death. Importantly for me, the actions of activist groups like BLM Toronto open up an arena for rethinking how forms of black life interact with the state as the very means of, as the very means of a possible survival. A popular refrain of the BLM movement is, we will get free. In my view, the actions of BLM and other black radical activist groups presently engaged in direct action tactics return us to the languages and ideas of freedom, emancipation, and liberty. Indeed, each of those terms, often used interchangeably, that is emancipation and freedom, carry very distinct meanings, especially when thinking black life. It is at the international that its implications reveal themselves, that its, comp sorry, its complications reveal themselves. How do we account for the U.S. imperial project in blackface? How do we think about global black dispossession when nation states remain still sturdy, sturdy in the face of fluid capital? How might we think the black global as more than the immediacy of our local and our national condition? Such questions find themselves being bitterly debated now, especially on social media, as the complications of the BLM movement. The power of BLM is, is, is the black global conversation it has in part rekindled. But it is, but it is resolved. But it's sorry. But how it is resolved remains to be seen. We still, nonetheless, have to pose the question of what might freedom be in this moment. All of the energies of Black life that produce the movement, energy, and the demands of and for BLM will remain with us until a concerted effort to think serious alternatives to global human organization is given serious thought. Indeed, we must invent alternative ways of being together and articulate them as possible, and we must be willing to put flesh to the bones of those new ways for living together. 
In the USA, we are already seeing both liberal incorporation and intra-black political dissent around what the future might look like for the movement. Indeed, it is clear that few are willing to begin to articulate alternatives to our present mode of life and, still play, and instead claim pragmatic reformist agenda, agendas. History teaches us that such a move signals the already defeat of larger political horizons. Such a retreat means for me that BLM is in many ways a stall movement now. Thus the refrain of BLM that we will get free is crucial in so many different ways. So if I return to this question of, um, of, of knowing that the, or, that the movement was founded by three black queer women, um, what we see also simultaneously is the larger movement's most liberal arm as, kept, as encapsulated in the black queer personhood of someone like DeRay Mackerson. And the politics of intra-community intra violence on queer and trans people is a central aspect or a rhetoric of the movement. Black queer experiences and resistance to violence in multiple communities can be considered the foundational intervention of the LM. The we will get free can be read as free from, from such violence and by extension free to self-determinate. What BLM gets, gets at is a certain kind of temperament. It is a temperament that is both emotional and social, political and cultural. It's a temperament that is an analysis of the present time and its past. But this temperament also exposes the limits of claiming freedom. This temperament reveals that freedom is still beyond us. So what do I mean by freedom then? For me, freedom marks a certain kind of sovereignty over the self in relation to collective and communal conditions. In the context of one freedom, we can glimpse most modes of unauthorized being as self-authored acts pointing to or authorizing the potential freedom to come. Here I'm thinking of the ways in which black people break rules, authorizing for themselves new ways of being in the world. These ways of being are often violently interdicted. Freedom is the gap or space between breaking the law and the reimposition of the law or its variance that is violence. The law is violence in this conception that I'm offering. The law then always curtails freedom for black personhood in the West. The human sciences have been called half starved as Sylvia Winter has stated for numerous good reasons. The human senses remain deeply complicit with the regimes of knowledge, power, and practice that subtend and produce the material effects and conditions of unfreedom. The radical move would be for the contemporary human sciences to produce the ne necessary sustenance required to both undo the chimera effects of democracy and freedom and instead point us towards a new perspective. One in, which, one in which grappling with black being might yet produce the roots, intellectual and otherwise, for freedom yet to come. It is the BLM call that we will be free in the face of contemporary state violences of all kinds that keeps open the possibility of a freedom yet to come. Thank you. It's really important, but something that kind of uh, falls to the wayside, I think, when we're thinking about these things in the academy is um, how similar these long-standing traditions are upon which these movements um, our, our premise. So uh, in the media, we tend to see, um, it's, it's tend to portray it as something that's kind of uh, temporally shallow. Um, it's often reactionary, uh, but, they but, but when we look at it in, in light of, of uh, my colleagues' um, comments here, we realize that there's very um, historical, incredible historical depth and, and, and theoretical like acumen in terms of what is being targeted um, with respect to the actions that, that kind of constitute Black Lives Matter, and, and I would say actually less so. Um, I don't know more um, based on, on Leanne's persuasive critiques. And this is the structural violences and effects of uh, capitalism, of anti-blackness, of displacement, and of dispossession and of course heteropatriarchy. And how this has, um, Black Lives Matter and I Don't Know More has kind of consistently been um, in a contest with those structures of violence. And what we see in the media is just uh, percolating kind of crisis points that I think bleed over um, into these spectacular displays that uh, uh, a media structure that doesn't really give a shit about either indigenous peoples or black peoples are now kind of forced to confront. 
So they have long histories that intersect, and I like how both actual authors or authors uh, speakers also show how historically they have also been cross fertilizations between the two. Where did those cross fertilizations go? What happened to that type of coalition building, that sort of solidarity and that cross fertilization uh, between people in Africa, uh, the global south, and and indigenous peoples of the fourth world? And I actually think it was, it was that move from that internationalism of that time to a struggle for constitutional recognition for one's cultural like, diversity within, within, within the Constitution in 1981 and 1982. And that kind of placed us as indigenous peoples in a silo where we're kind of thinking for ourselves and only about ourselves and forgot about um, um, others peoples who are, who are, fav are um, facing similar structural violences in their own lives and conditions. So one of the ways in which I like, I would just like to, I would hope to see this, these kind of, these silos break down again. And, and, and that's what I love about this panel 